Okay. <laughs> so Dr. Haller is the first speaker. I see he is on. I'm just not sure if he's stepped away from the computer. Oh, where'd it go? Oh, there you go. I'm sorry, I'm here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So um, everyone else, I, I think we can all turn off our cameras otherwise, unless you just want to be on the recording staring in awe at everyone's presentations. <laughs> um, so I'm going to turn off my camera in a second. And with that, I'm going to actually pass it over to Dr. Haller, who's going to, I'm going to share my screen. Is that okay? Do you want me to advance the slides for you? Perfect. And we can get started. What's happening? Okay. Hold on. That's not what I want to do. That's what I want to do. There we go. Okay. And I'm going away. Take it away. All right. Thanks. Uh, I really appreciate the uh, opportunity to come and talk today. Um, you know, this project has been um, ongoing for a little while. And, and thanks to a lot of you on this call, uh, you know, we've been collecting more uh, DNA from patients and family members. Um, and we have, you know, our first publication, uh, which I think was a good one, uh, that came out pretty recently. Um, and where we, uh, yeah, are, uh, I'll talk to you about today, uh, these interesting genes that we found uh, to be associated with Ki1 malformation. Next slide. So I'd like to first start off uh, with a little um, promo um, so if there's any uh, QRI patients uh, on the call who haven't uh, signed up to be part of the study already, or um, for anyone on the call who'd be interested in telling a patient about the, the genetic study, uh, you can send them to this, uh, or anyone watching this video after it's been recorded. Um, you can just scan this QR code and it'll bring you to our website uh, where you can sign up on a REDCap database. Uh, we'll contact you. Uh, ask you questions and um, and just send you out a kit uh, in the mail, which is just a saliva-based kit uh, to collect your DNA if you're interested. So uh, next slide, please. This is what the kit looks like. It's very non-invasive. There's no blood or anything. You just swish uh, scope in your mouth and then you um, put that uh, into a tube uh, also depicted there. And then you send it back in a pre-labeled package no cost, and it goes in any US uh, PS mailbox and comes back to us. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, currently, uh, as part of sort of the Park Reeves Chiari Genetics Consortium. OK, sorry, Dexter. Um, we have a number of uh, sites now that are uh, collecting data uh, and patient uh, samples. Uh, some of them are listed here. There are a few enrolling. There are some in the process of, of um, becoming uh, sites as part of this consortium. Um, and we are the uh, sort of DNA collection uh, coordinating site. Uh, and uh, we've been collecting now an additional, um, I think we've gotten around 300 more samples since we started collecting from all of these sites. And it's, a, it's been an amazing turnout from, um, uh, from patients uh, around the country. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the total uh, numbers of patients that we have DNA for currently. Um, and these are the sites, uh, oh, sorry, that one should actually be uh, the hospital for uh, sick kids. Uh, in Toronto, sorry, <laughs> yeah. Um, but it, uh, we just got that up and running, uh, partially because Canada, we had to work out some logistics for sending kits back and forth. But we have now um, over 1,900 uh, patients and relatives enrolled in the study. And so the story I'll tell you in about five seconds is that uh, is sort of uh, the first story before we started collecting from all of these different sites. Uh, but largely consists of patients from WashU, from the University of Utah, from the BioVU, which is a repository for DNA samples and, and clinical information at Vanderbilt, uh, and uh, a number of study uh, samples also from Duke and from in, in Spain. So uh, next slide, please. 
So I like to show this for all of the Bobby Jones CSF uh, study uh, uh, presentations I give because uh, it's amazing the kind of uh, outreach you can get uh, from and help from uh, when uh, social media is used. So when the Bobby Jones CSF tweeted about our genetic study, in both cases, we had a, a, a great outpouring of support from patients being interested in, in enrolling in the study. Um, and so, uh, and this has even gone up uh, exponentially as um, more sites have been enrolling. Next slide, please. And so we send out kits like these, their boxes to the sites, um, and they just send them back to us. It's very simple. So just so you know, if you're, if you're interested, please contact me or uh, Dave Lindbrick. Um, and we're happy to, you know, enroll more more um, sites uh, to become parts of part of the Park Reeves Consortium. Next slide. Um, and as part of this, because of the website, we've actually gotten uh, a lot of various patients and family members coming from all over the country, not just those that are uh, part of the consortium currently, uh, but from all of these uh, various. Um, <laughs> Uh, hospitals across the and, and sites across the country. Next step, next step. Please. Okay, so getting into the science, um, you know, with this wonderful consortium that a lot of you are part of, uh, we've been able to collect DNA on uh, patients with PRI malformation. Uh, generally, we, we simply use the, the normal five millimeters uh, herniation cutoff, uh, not anything more severe per se. Um, though many of the patients also have syringomyelia um, and other uh, comorbidities, but um, for the most part, the PR patients are uh, that we've been collecting are idiopathic, so they don't have a syndrome or um, other genetic known cause associated with PR. But of course, um, you know, about one in a thousand people in the in the general population has a PR malformation. Uh, which amounts to about 3% of, of patients who undergo MRI. Um, but that, that increase in percentage is largely due to the fact that many of the patients are found uh, to have PRI malformation when uh, given an MRI due to headache evaluation. So, um, so that, that's the majority of the patients in our study are these uh, sorts of normal uh, patients who have PRI malformation. Next slide, please. So uh, I like to also always show that there is good evidence that PRI malformation is genetic. There have been twin studies. Uh, there has been uh, good evidence from familial clustering of, of patients within families. Uh, non Twin affected siblings, for instance, are more likely to have PRI malformation than um, uh, random uh, individuals in the population. Um, and then lastly, uh, there are quite a few genetic syndromes and other sorts of uh, disorders that often have PRI malformation as a, as a, a phenotype. So that includes connective tissue disorders, uh, which I know a lot of you are very interested in in respect to PRI malformation. Uh, craniosynostosis, uh, neurofibromatosis, et cetera. So, uh, next slide, please. So uh, there's also good evidence from uh, genetic studies that have been done over the years. The most recent uh, was a study beyond the one that I'll describe, is one that was uh, performed in uh, this this year and found a number of collagen mutations, which we previously have also found to be associated with idiopathic scoliosis uh, in patients with PRI malformation. And that was um, from Allison Ashley Koch's group um, at Duke. Um, but there are a number of studies that have shown uh, strong genetic associations with PRI malformation. Next slide. And again, these are sort of the list of disorders that we've observed in our patient population at WashU uh, in patients with PRI malformation. Um, and so you can see a lot of them are uh, things like overgrowth syndromes um, and 
connective tissue disorders, but also a, a various neurological conditions. Next slide, please. Now, um, of course, again, in our, in our patient population at WashU at least, what we've found is about 70% of patients don't have any underlying uh, condition that could, could be explaining their PR malformation. So those include things like CNS disorders, genetic disorders, uh, multiple congenital anomalies, skeletal disorders, or in this case, most of them are idiopathic. Dr. Hall, you're, you're muted, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I know, my, my children just came in. <laughs> oh, it's okay. And uh, they are loud, so sorry. <laughs> um, next slide, please. Uh, and these are just a, a few of those uh, disorders in the accounts. So what we can see is that, uh, particularly in our population, there's hydrocephalus is, is quite common, uh, growth hormone disorders, uh, autism and developmental delay are also quite common among the PR patients in our data set. Um, and things like uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, neurofibromatosis, Lloyd-Dietz syndrome, connective tissue disorders that, um, again, are, are sort of clinically known to be related to PRI malformation um, are enriched in our data set. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, we've now collected many uh, pedigrees uh, of patients uh, and their families that have Chiari malformation. Uh, so these are some of the ones that we've collected from around St. Louis and WashU. Next slide. And then we also have a number of uh, relatively large pedigrees from the University of Utah in collaboration with Doug Brockmeyer. Uh, next slide, please. And um, some with Alphonse Makaya um, at the uh, University Hospital in Val de Hebron in Barcelona, Spain. Next slide, please. Um, and of course, uh, we've sort of got interested in this in the relationship between scoliosis and Chiari um, and the genetic sort of similarities potentially, uh, because I, I previously studied scoliosis. Uh, in my uh, research career. Um, and we constantly found uh, patients, particularly young girls, that had both a syrinx and Chiari malformation. So um, our, our sort of genetic study sort of stemmed from that scoliosis study. And so a lot of the patients uh, in our data set also have uh, scoliosis, um, but not not as many now that we've uh, started unbiasedly collecting patients with PR malformation, um, but still an enriched proportion compared to the general population. Next slide, please. So um, in order to study the genetics of PR malformation what, uh, and the study that we I'll, I'll present, uh, we initially had uh, 680 Chiari-1 patients and their family members from around 300 families. Uh, in, in this first study, we, we started by sequencing uh, uh, more severe uh, patients, people who had uh, greater than 10 millimeters of tonsillar herniation. Um, a large proportion of them had syringomyelia as well, and uh, a good number of them also would have been defined as having Chiari-1.5 uh, in that their obex was below uh, the foramen magnum. And many uh, had substantially uh, lower obexes than their foramen magnum. Um, all of the ones that we sequenced were European Americans, uh, just for ease of uh, statistical analysis. And then we compared those to, at the time, 3750 control patients that we've collected from WashU and uh, around the country um, who uh, our general population controls, and so some proportion of these could have Chiari malformation, but given the rarity of Chiari malformation, we, found, we thought it would be uh, appropriate still to use population controls. Next slide, please. So the first thing we did when we uh, looked at uh, 
sequencing the exomes, which is the exon coding sequences um, in the genomes of PRI patients and controls, was to compare the frequency of rare protein altering variants in each gene in the genome. And so how that works is, so uh, everybody in the population generally has many um, unique variants, say, um, mutations in their genome in, in specific genes that uh, no one else, at least to date, have been found to have. And so we, what we can do is take all of the different uh, protein altering variants in a, in a given gene um, and collapse them into a, a count. So in this case, if each line is a, a different chromosome, we have eight people who have variants in the cases and only two uh, p uh, chromosomes in the controls. And we can compare that frequency using a simple uh, statistical test, like a chi-squared test. And we can do that for each gene in the genome, which is about 20,000 genes. Um, and then see which genes come to the top uh, as far as statistical association. Next slide, please. And so we, when, when we do this, what we end up with is about 20,000 p-values. And if we line up uh, random p-values in sorted order and compare them to the observed p-values in sorted order, what we find is uh, generally a good uh, correlation, which means that the p-values generally follow a random distribution. But any of these dots that fall off the line, particularly above the line, means the observed p-value is actually uh, more significant than expected by chance. Um, and so when we talk about things like von Peroni correction for multiple testing, what that means is that we need to have uh, a p-value below 0.05, which is a nominal p-value, um, divided by the number of tests that we've done, uh, which in this case is about 20,000, one per gene, and which amounts to about five times 10 to the minus six p-value. And so the only gene that we found to be more significant than that uh, relatively um, stringent cutoff per p-value was this gene CHD3. Next, uh, next slide, please. And so this is the a sort of schematic of the gene with all of its parts um, uh, depicted in different colors, its different domains. And in black are previous variants that have been shown to uh, have arisen, arisen de novo, meaning they don't occur in the parents, but do occur in the, in the child. Um, and uh, in patients with uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, and in gray and the red line are actually variants that occur in, a, in the general population um, at relatively high frequencies. Um, so those are actually anti-correlated. So the variants happen in, in neurodevelopmental cases are often in this, these purple helicase domains, which are highly evolutionarily conserved. Um, and most of the ones that don't uh, fall in those are, are in the general population. And what we see is in blue on the top are variants observed in Chiari patients. And while some two of them do arise in this uh, important helicase domain, a number of them uh, don't. And, and so our hypothesis is that these variants are probably halfway in between, uh, you know, benign variants that occur in the general population and uh, these very important gene uh, location variants, like those that occur in the helicase domain. Sorry, my children are children. <laughs> Um, okay. You're good. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. <laughs> um, so yeah, CHD3 was our, our top hit from our gene burden analysis, but another analysis that is uh, that we can do when we have um, both the proband, so the patient uh, here depicted in black, uh, who has PR malformation and their parent sequence. And so when we do that, what we can uh, find is de novo variants, so those variants that occur in the patient, but 
uh, do not occur in either parent, which means that they arose in the germline of one of the parents and was then passed on to the child. So we did this sort of analysis for uh, 67 sequence trios. So trio being these uh, three people. And in general, what we see is that one to four uh, rare de novo coding variants occur uh, in each of these uh, patients. And that's generally what you see. Uh, next slide, please. And these are the variants that we uh, uh, observed in those 67 patients that were of interest, uh, i.e. they were uh, coding variants in interesting genes and, or uh, nonsense or frame shift variants. And what we initially uh, very quickly observed was interesting was this variant in CHD8. Um, Uh, which interestingly is a very uh, similar gene to the CHD3 gene that we found in gene burn analysis. Uh, next slide, please. There's some sound, I don't know what it is. Um, and then if we uh, look at these de novo variants as a group, so all of these uh, different genes and different variants, what we can see is that um, we can test for the enrichment of these de novo variants um, in uh, various gene uh, classes. So either genes that are expressed within the brain, uh, genes that are known to cause uh, Mendelian diseases, uh, so dominant or in some cases recessive uh, 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 Mendelian disorders, um, or the, the intersection of the two. So brain expressed omen, uh, disease genes. And in each of these cases, we saw that missense variants or uh, all protein altering variants, but not synonymous variants were in, enriched uh, in these gene classes uh, for de novo variants, suggesting that some of these variants um, actually are causing or contributing to risk of Gary malformation, but we don't have enough samples to statistically determine which of these specific genes is contributing to uh, Chiari risk. Uh, next slide. You're doing great. <laughs> Excuse my children. They keep turning on the sink and leaving it on, and it's uh, something. Uh, <laughs> Um, so the CHD8 uh, variant that we saw was very interesting because of the CHD3 association that we saw. And so we uh, went to a, pro a, a program called Gene Matcher, which um, you put in a gene and a disease or a disorder, and you ask uh, people around the world whether or not they have other patients who happen to have a similar variant in, in that gene. And we did that, and we... Um, got back results from six patients um, and interesting two of those six patients who had a, a similar loss of function variant CHD8 also had Chiari malformation and was was also interesting was that all three of them uh, were diagnosed with um, macrocephaly and they were all relatively young kids so they were seven uh, 13 and 10 years uh, five years old at the time of diagnosis and each of them had loss of function or predicted loss of function variants in the CHD8 gene. Um, so statistically, uh, the, the probability of, of seeing three different variants in such a rare condition like Chiari malformation, uh, all of which were uh, damaging, was extremely uh, unlikely. And so this is arguably one of the first genetic uh, causes of, of Chiari malformation, though uh, I would add that it's not 100% penetrant because there's um, many people who have loss of function variants in this gene who do not have macrocephaly, um, but a hands and or, or Chiari malformation. So it's sort of uh, not fully penetrant, uh, but arguably still causative. Uh, next slide, please. And then we also were interested to know if uh, these CHD genes in, in general were associated because of this uh, you know, paired association with both CHD3 and CHD8 um, uh, in the sample. 
And so we simply compared the frequency of, of rare protein altering variants uh, in our, the Chiari cases that we sequenced and controls and compared the frequency for each of these genes and uh, the combined uh, sum of, across all of these genes. And in, in several cases, we saw a nominal association, for instance, in CHD2, uh, again, CHD3 was the top hit, um, but also with CHD7 and CHD6. And a lot of these uh, genes have sort of similar phenotypes uh, compared to CHD3 and CHD8. And then when we collapse all of these genes together into one um, sort of large test of association to see whether or not this gene class is associated with QRM malformation, we, we again see this enrichment um, uh, compared to controls. Right, next slide, please. I was just highlighting it. Um, and then because of this association that uh, it was seen between CHD8 and CH3 and both of those genes being um, associated with macrocephaly within the, uh, the patients who have the developmental disorders associated with those genes, we went back to our PR patients and asked whether or not um, the, our patients in general or the patients with specific CHD3 variants uh, or CHD8 variants uh, or all CHD gene variants had uh, larger heads uh, for age than expected by chance. And although uh, only a handful of patients within the data set had overt macrocephaly, i.e. their head size was above the 95th percentile here, the top line uh, corrected for age and sex, so uh, females in pink and males in blue, uh, though that was also significantly enriched uh, for patients with um, you know, explicit macrocephaly, clinical macrocephaly. What we saw was that the average head size uh, for age in both males and females was above the 50th percentile in the vast majority of cases, um, and the, that their head sizes were significantly different um, than uh, expected by chance. Um, and that can be seen on the right with sort of a histogram um, of the average head size for both male and female compared to the CDC uh, standard, which is set at zero. Um, next slide, please. Um, and then lastly, we, we um, performed segmentation of the brain of uh, using the MRIs. Um, we performed segmentation of the MRI uh, brain scans of a, a, about a few, like maybe 200, I think, uh, QRI patients that we had uh, high quality MRI scans with uh, sufficient numbers of slices through their, um, through their brains and, and asked if any specific brain regions, when, when you uh, specifically calculate the volumes of different brain regions from the MRI, were different compared to uh, a group of controls, uh, which were MRI confirmed not to have Chiari um, by our clinical coordinator, but had an MRI for some um, unrelated reason uh, and came to WashU and used the same scanners. And so what we saw was that, again, that there's this, this sort of second peak of patients uh, with uh, larger head uh, brain volumes, actually, um, in Chiari patients compared to controls. Um, but also that actually QR patients often had uh, smaller blood vessels, uh, total blood vessel volumes, smaller ventricle volumes, and larger cerebellum uh, volumes. And this can all sort of be related to the, the, like, the presence of Chiari, I would say, uh, potentially, other than um, total brain volume, which actually does not include the cerebellum. Um, yeah. uh, next slide, please. So in order to uh, sort of continue and follow this up, uh, we created a knockout zebrafish line uh, to investigate the effects of knocking out the gene CHG8, which we observed loss of function variants in Chiari patients. Um, and so we did this by the CRISPR-Cas9, um, now sort of canonical system uh, to knock out genes um, in multiple organisms. Um, so we take eggs from across a zebrafish, 
we inject those eggs at the one to two cell stage with these uh, CRISPR um, reagents. And that creates uh, double strand breaks that often uh, result in um, incorrect uh, repair and in insertions of small um, insertion deletion polymorphisms within the genome. We can then take sperm from males that we've then mutagenized, cross them to um, uh, female fish that have uh, green fluorescent protein expressed in all of their neurons. And then we can use uh, confocal microscopy to quickly create uh, 3D uh, reconstructions uh, in fluorescence of the brains of these zebra fish um, that have these gene knockouts. Next slide, please. And so uh, what we observed um, by doing this was actually that the CHD, uh, even the heterozygous knockout zebrafish uh, display brain overgrowth, very uh, system, systematic brain overgrowth where almost the entire brain is increased in size compared to control zebrafish. So the wild type are in red um, and the CHD heterozygous knockout are in green. And I hope you can see that sort of there's this halo of green around the red, which means, and these brains are overlaid, the images, so that you can see that the green is almost always uh, larger than the red version. Um, next slide, please. And when we did this for uh, I, around 96 uh, fish um, of various genotypes, um, we saw that in all brain regions that we measured. So here in the forebrain, the midbrain, um, this is basically where the cerebellum is, if you can see my uh, pointer, uh, in the zebrafish, and then the hindbrain. Um, and in each case, uh, the CHD8 knockout fish had increased brain volumes. Um, however, when we compared the overall length of the zebrafish, um, there was no difference. So it wasn't actually overgrowth of the entire fish itself. Um, and this was at, uh, I believe, six days post-fertilization, but it was the brain volume specifically that was changed in these zebrafish. Uh, next slide, please. And arguably, you could uh, uh, say that the hindbrain of these fish was displaced uh, given the length of the brain compared to the body length of the zebrafish also, which is consistent with the idea that these this macrocephaly could be leading to um, hindbrain displacement and a Chiari-like phenotype in the zebrafish. Next slide, please. So that, that's all I have. Uh, in conclusion, um, you know, we have been finding in multiple conditions, but particularly here in Chiari malformation, that we find sort of mild rare variants in known disease genes, CHG3, CHGA, and others, um, that increase your risk of Chiari malformation, uh, but don't cause the overt Mendelian disease that they're known for. So that includes CHD3 variants um, and de novo loss of pharynx. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, that de novo loss of function variants in CHD8 also now uh, are shown to cause this macrocephaly associated Chiari malformation in some cases. Um, and I think what's most in interesting uh, from this, this sort of genetic study is that we're actually able to show potentially for the first time that there is this macrocephaly associated subclass of patients with Chiari malformation um, that are associated with total brain volume increase, cerebellum increase, and some, somewhat associated with these decreased blood vessel and ventricle volumes, particularly the fourth ventricle, um, which I didn't, I guess, show. Um, <clears throat> and that CHD8 knockout fish uh, have this increased brain volume, which is consistent with our findings of the CHD genes in macrocephaly in humans. Um, but that zebrafish can also be uh, a useful model of zebrafish, of, of PR malformation in the future when we find additional uh, genetic associations. Fingers crossed. Um, so, yeah. Next slide, please. So, uh, yeah, with that, I'd like to just thank everybody who helped. Um, 
in my lab, uh, previously in the Garnett, Garnett lab, everyone at WashU, various specific uh, um, collaborators that I've had um, in recent past are funding. And then on the next slide, I'd like to give a, a, a shout out to all of the, the participating sites um, for the Park Reeves uh, Chiari Genetics Consortium that have been so great and, and, and being part of the consortium and sending samples to our coordinating site. And hopefully we'll have a next, the next paper out you know, soon once we get um, these huge numbers of samples that are coming in every day uh, sequenced. So thanks. Thank you, Dr. Holler. Um, I Welcome. think while I, <laughs> while I get the next speaker up and ready, Dr. Professor Toro, does anyone have any questions for Dr. Holler? Uh, if I could just, I can make a quick comment. Uh, this is, for, for, first of all, fabulous work and a great presentation, including the children. And uh, I think that uh, the clinical uh, one of the clinical pictures you described looks so much like pseudotumor cerebri, and I was wondering if you've uh, been able to look or would consider looking into a pseudotumor cerebri population. I think this genetic change might have some relevance there. As we all know, pseudotumor cerebri also has uh, relationships to Chiari uh, malformation. Yeah, I think, you know, our next step is is uh, sort of doing that sort of sub subclassification of Chiari patients that we have both genetic and not genetic information on to try and understand, yeah, the the sort of underlying cause of Chiari in, in these specific patients. So yeah, I, I'm very interested in, in looking more at those patients and, and, and the others to try and understand the different sort of underlying um, relationships between brain, you know, uh, characteristics, for instance, uh, skull characteristics and other uh, conditions that are, you know, more prone uh, to contribute to Chiari. Definitely. Yeah, great, great talk. I thought it was really interesting. Um, for the CHD8 uh, classifiers, I mean, what, what have you seen in terms of beyond the brain? Is there anything that you are able to pick up in the spine or anything else that could be a clue? Um, in the CHD8 and CHD3 patients particularly, you know, we don't see too many things that are out of the ordinary other than um, sort of the increased brain and or at least head size in most of the patients. Um, <clears throat> sort of a predictable proportion have syringomyelia, um, like the average for Chiari. Um, yeah, I, we don't see very many outlier kind of phenotypes other than other than Chiari in those patients. Okay. Um, Dr. Ashley Koch, you can go. I'm just trying to get uh, Professor Toro to share the slides. So you okay. Can <laughs> hey, sorry. I um I was typing in the chat, but great job, uh, Kate, especially okay. with your kids kind of in the background. Um, <laughs> so that was impressive. Um, so I may have asked you this question before. I mean, first of all, I will say it's really cool that I think you probably have kind of identified a novel subset of Chiari patients. You know, and I know the Park Reeves is heavily pediatric, but one of my right. questions was, have you found any patients with mutations in one of those genes that actually had adult onset. So I was just trying to, to figure out whether it was unique to the PEDS group. Um, so all of the CHD8 loss of function variants uh, were in human kids, um, but some of the CHD3 variants, which I think are less sort of penetrant, some of those did occur in in adults, and so I think it is that you know some pay, you know they have sort of sub subclinical macrocephaly. There's a lot of kids who we have head measurements on, and even my head is is arguably pretty close to macrocephalic, but I was never given a diagnosis or anything. So I mean I think you know when people have particularly large heads, um, even as adults, it may be contributing to their risk of Chiari. 
but it also um, might not be picked up by a doctor if there's no, you know, hydrocephalus associated with it or anything like that. So, um, but yeah, some of the CHD3 patients definitely were um, adults or at least nearing adulthood. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Muller.